You are listening to a free version of the Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. Hey folks, you know in today's world that data security could not be more important. you got to protect your data. Behind the scenes, VMA, uh, VMR, VM, VMware's cybersecurity software is working overtime to ensure our virtual environments are safe and secure. DH Technologies and VMware are here to offer you a free demo of their virtualization software. Go to dhtech.com slash demo to find out how to protect your organization today. The Majority Report with With Sam Sam Cedar. It is Monday, June 26, 2017. My name is Michael Brooks on a Michael Monday, and this is the four-time award-winning Majority Report. We're broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On today's program, Guardian columnist Owen Jones on the dying neoliberal order in the UK and hopefully the world over and why the likelihood of Jeremy Corbyn becoming the United Kingdom's next prime minister becomes more likely every day. It's a rebirth of democratic socialism. Can it happen globally? Plus, the Republicans are aiming take away tens of millions of people's health care, get rid of protection for pre-existing conditions, literally to subsidize a tax cut for about 400 families. Kellyanne Conway says, hey, if you lose Medicaid, just get a job. Many people on Medicaid, of course, in fact, have jobs. Republican moderates like Dean Heller facing heat, pretending that they won't vote for this, but they're playing word games. Saudi Arabia making overtures to Israel as Mahmoud Abbas, the head of the Palestinian Authority, as well as Israel, implement electricity cuts in Gaza. They see it as an opportunity to dislodge Hamas, Hamas betting wrong by cozying up to the Gulf. It's all part of a influx and very dangerous broader Middle East get to that sam harris finally makes his way back into the majority report new depths of creepy pseudo-intellectual sociopathy with really almost exiting his soft alt-right stance to a more overt one while so-called muslim reformer majad majad nawaz listens doesn't necessarily co-sign. I'm sure that that will be helpful in his lawsuit against the Southern Poverty Law Center. And speaking of those kinds of people, very pathetic performance for the free speech rally in D.C. that took place. Richard Spencer and others showing up. It was a small, sparse crowd with a bleak, sparse, and awful message. All that... And so much more, including some sound where a Republican congressman like, would like to remind us of drag the body to the park. All that and more on today's uh, Majority Report. Um, we're going to talk to Owen Jones about Jeremy Corbyn, but this really was something. Um, he went to the Glastonbury Music Festival, um, which is, of course, big globally recognized music festival in Scotland and Glastonbury. And there was the kind of usual tired, boring, like, oh, look, Jeremy Corbyn's going in front of all these upscale socialists at a music, uh, at a festival, and they're chanting for socialism, even though they have enough money to go to a festival. Actually, Corbyn's leader, uh, Corbyn's Labour Party actually won some of the wealthiest districts in the UK, and there's plenty of people of means who would actually like to see a better world and have problems addressed. So there's nothing particularly shocking about it. Socialism actually, in fact, benefits the many, not the few. Here is Jeremy. Well, Glastonbury is in Somerset, England, not Scotland. Oh, pardon me. Excuse me. Why did I thought of that of Edinburgh? I don't know why I thought of that. Edinburgh is a theater festival. My mistake. My mistake. Okay. In the UK, in Britain, 
Here is Jeremy Corbyn addressing the crowd and quoting one of his favorite poets. One of my favorite poets, Percy Bysshe Shelley, who wrote in the early 19th century many, many poems and traveled extensively around Europe. But the line I like the best is this one. Rise like lions after slumber in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. I quote Shelley because he inspired like so many others do. I'm proud to be at Glastonbury because it inspires so many to music festivals all over the country. Let us be together and recognize another world is possible if we come together to understand that, understand the power we've got and achieve that decent, better society where everyone matters and those poverty-stricken people are enriched in their lives and the rest of us are made secure by their enrichment. Thank you very much, Glastonbury. Thank you for inviting me here today. I'm proud to be here. It's beautiful. And the mythology that Jeremy Corbyn was some type of relic from people that were relics of the 1990s becomes more and more clear every day. That's the future. That's the stake globally. And Jeremy for, uh, Corbyn is carrying that forward. And it's not a surprise to see him at Glastonbury. And it makes a lot of sense that a lot of younger people, as well as people who are privileged, see a larger picture. And that's all he's articulating there. There's nothing surprising about it. And when the hack tabloid press in the UK is reduced to, look at how much Glastonbury tickets cost, and they like Jeremy Corbyn, we know that we have momentum. And when you have momentum, or really any other time, you want to feel comfortable. And pride starts on the inside. So celebrate yourself with Me Undies. Me Undies makes the ultimate feel good undies with free shipping right to your door. Satisfaction guaranteed. Designed in LA. Every pair of MeUndies is made with micromodal fabric, three times softer than cotton. Their soft, stretchy undies come in ever-changing array of colors and patterns, no matter what your style. They've got something for you. Yes, Matt. I've got some Toy Soldiers ones on the way. That does not surprise me at all. That's because MeUndies believes in people feeling good and being themselves, which is why MeUndies is putting their money where their underwear is during Pride Month. This is great. For every pair of special edition MeUndies you buy during Pride Month, MeUndies will donate $1 to Los Angeles LGBT Center. And as if you need another reason to try me in these, they're offering 20% off of your first pair and satisfaction guaranteed that you'll love them or your money back. Just visit our URL, meundies.com slash majority. Head to MeUndies today. Pick up a pair of special edition. Celebrate MeUndies, and you'll not only get a discount on awesome undies, you'll be donating to an amazing cause. Check out meundies.com slash majority today. Come on. You know what it is. We will be right back with Owen Jones on the majority. The future's been sold Every night we're gone And some karaoke songs How we like to sing along Though the words are wrong in red
Welcome back to the Majority Report. I'm Michael Brooks. Joining us now is Owen Jones. He's a columnist for The Guardian and an activist. Owen, thanks so much for joining us. Ah, what an honor. What a huge honor to be here. So, Owen, I'm a longtime admirer of your work. Uh, I think you're someone who uh, has a sort of perfect kind of synthesis of a global genuine left perspective and solidarity which we're hopefully developing and a very specific understanding of british politics which um those of us that are interested in the uk in and of itself and i think now many of us who are interested in any counter trend to the disaster that we've been into the last several mm -hmm. decades in fact are inspired and interested by you have a new column we're going to get to the larger picture but you have a column just published and I, we played before uh, we started the clip of Jeremy Corbyn speaking at Glastonbury uh, and the crowd really sort of rapturous for him, almost kind of. I mean, really the only comparisons I could think of in modern politics would be Bernie Sanders and Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. um, you talked and you kind of made light of this lazy trope that you and you see a different version of it here but this idea is like oh you're middle class and you can afford to be at a festival but you support jeremy corbyn how ridiculous now you explain why the socialism jeremy corbyn advocates is actually beneficial not only for those stricken by poverty but in fact the middle class as well i'd like you to explain that and also explain what you mean by middle class in a british context yeah, well, we, we we use middle class in quite a different way to people in the United States. To us, middle class generally means uh, professional, mm -hmm. uh, more affluent. Um, it means, for example, I don't know, more likely to be people with university degrees who do professional jobs. Um, working class for us is more likely to be, uh, I don't know, skilled workers, for example, people who work in offices, in factories, in supermarkets. It, so basically... The American concept of middle class is more our concept of working class, if that makes sense. Yes. Now, for a long time in, in Britain, the, the argument often used against the left is you will never, ever win over middle class voters. The more affluent voters uh, in society who are in under our electoral system seem to be absolutely critical to any government forming uh, a majority. Uh, we have first past the post like, like you guys. Uh, that, that's impossible. So-called middle England. Uh, that was always misconstrued. Uh, the real Middle England, uh, you know, the median wage in this country is uh, is about twenty six thousand pounds. I'm just saying, right. what is that in dollars? That's I don't know. Here we go. I'm typing it in. Yeah. Uh, it's about thirty three thousand dollars. <laughs> That's they a real journalist right there. As a commentator, I, I, I would I would have just made it up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> got to be accurate. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that was the argument. But now what's quite, quite, quite comical is Labour having defied expectations. This general election was called by uh, our calamitous Prime Minister Theresa May in, in the what seems like a lifetime in British politics. Uh, but it was only April. She calls an election to crush the Labour Party, who at the time were on 23 percent of the polls. They ended up getting over 40 percent, running the Conservatives close uh, on a radical left wing programme. Uh, which was seen to defy political gravity. But some commentators in the aftermath who had previously claimed there was no chance of any left-wing agenda getting anywhere near 40%, be looking to get 25 20%, lots of those people felt, uh, they've now said it's the wrong voters, that there were too many middle-class voters, that Labour had, uh, hadn't uh, gone, you know, advanced amongst working-class voters. Mm -hmm. but, but the argument actually is, you know, <laughs> what so, you know, I think... Uh, uh, just so pioneering about this form of socialism which is being reborn in Britain is it's a coalition of working class and middle class voters. So, for example, one of the policies uh, which uh, Labour has committed to is to abolish, abolish student debt. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got some of the highest levels of, of student debt for people punished for aspiring to an education in the entire Western world. Um, and you know, the argument used by centrists was this is just a, a handout to the middle classes. 
But of course, Labour under the, under the left should be arguing to help both working class and middle class, those middle income families and also those who are in poverty. And that's the coalition we're building. And what's so fascinating is because Labour went into this election saying the top 5 percent, those earning more than 80,000 pounds a year should pay more tax. Right. Uh, corporation tax should go up. It's mm. still, by the way, a lot lower than it is in the United States, even after even after Labour uh, plans to increase corporation tax, mm-hmm. as well as the so-called financial transaction tax on the city, which caused uh, the city of London, which caused a financial disaster here in Britain. That's uh, your that, Wall that's Street. Funny. It's the equivalent of Wall Street, exactly, right. that we can use that money to invest in public services. Now, the Blairite, New Labour, centrist, our equivalent of the Clintonites, if you like, yep. they would have argued if you ask the top 5% to pay more money, middle class voters will be repelled because even if they're not in that top 5%, they aspire to get there one day. There's that expression in the United States yes. isn't that, you know, uh, all Americans uh, feel they're millionaires who've fallen on hard luck. Right. And it was that sense, that was the argument used, but it didn't work. We had an increase in middle class support, uh, including people who might one day earn over £80,000 and be asked to pay a bit more money. So I think what we're seeing is all the claims about the left of being upturned, that you can build a potentially winning coalition of working class and middle class of the more affluent and the poorest in society. And that is how we're going to transform American society, British society and societies across the Western world. Yeah, I, that's exactly right. And I just I have two two or one note and then two uh, questions I'll fold into one. I mean, if I, I remember, I think one, I, I, it was many years, I mean, I was, I don't even remember what, it was a while ago, but I just, I remember watching a television program on probably on, you know, cable years mm-hmm. ago and watching an analyst actually say, well, you know, the difficult thing about taxes is that a lot of Americans think to themselves, I don't want to be taxed at a high rate one day when I make a million, a million dollars. Yeah, and I just yeah. remember being, you know, I was like, I was probably high, to be honest. And I just remember being like, that's a serious thing you could say on television <laughs> that we can't implement a national policy that needs to happen now because of somebody's potential future, like, dream board <laughs> fantasy life. Like, what <laughs> world am I living in? That's the most ludicrous thing I've ever heard. But the, so the, the, the other things, and I, I one is specific specific to the UK and the other I think is more kind of global because I think the other thing that I, that just sort of strikes me as an observer is that if the conservatives are going to run around and say that labor under Jeremy Corbyn and McDonald are irresponsible and you can't trust them with macroeconomic decisions and they're out of touch with the global economy and all all of the sort of tropes and you know strong and steady and all of the nonsense about Theresa May well you know didn't the Tories kill their brand by leading us, leading you guys through Brexit, which is actually, you know, other than the bipartisan project of deregulating the city under Thatcher, Blair, and Brown, isn't that the by far the most irresponsible decision that's been undertaken in the modern UK era? I guess, you know, other than austerity. But, I mean, this is even worse just from that purely narrow technical economic standpoint. So there goes their reputation for competence. And then I think, you know, secondly, that what you were talking about as, as far as kind of upper, we would say in the United States, upper middle class voters or affluent voters, you know, it's not as if people who are not completely disconnected from real life, like, say, you know, the true plutocrats or, you know, Koch brother types of people. But even if people are doing quite well, they will have some direct experience, maybe even more so of a lot of people near them, like their kids, as an example, doing all of the quote unquote right things. Mm, going to wow. college, studying mm-hmm. something that makes sense, blah, 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 and seeing diminished job prospect, diminished earnings, massive debt. So I think this notion that these kind of more broad-based stagnation and inequalities are not felt by even people that might be potentially quite affluent is actually quite disconnected from how broad those problems really are. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot in that. I mean, on the Tories, on the Conservatives, yep. um, David Cameron, who our former Prime Minister, before the general election where he went up in 2015 against Ed Miliband, then leave the Labour Party, he tweeted out this tweet, which has now become pretty notorious for reasons you will soon discover. He, he tweeted, Britain faces a simple and inescapable choice. Stability and strong government with me 
or chaos with Ed Miliband. I tell you do, what, we've had do, nothing do. but stability. Yeah, nothing but stability for the last two years. Stability coming right. out of our ears. Yeah, obviously this is what's been unleashed ever since is the biggest period of political chaos since World War II in this country, where the political miscalculations of two conservative prime ministers, David Cameron and uh, Theresa May, uh, for parties and political purposes for the Conservative Party, have led to absolute chaos right. in this country. So David Cameron promised a referendum on the EU, not in the national interest, but because he had right-wing conservative backbenchers who were nipping at his heels. Uh, so he promised that referendum uh, and then completely mishandled it. Uh, and then that led to 52% of the population voting to leave. Right. That then led to him falling as prime minister. I, at the time, suggested he was the worst prime minister in Britain since Neville Chamberlain in the 1930s, who's notorious for appeasement. <laughs> But lots of historians corrected me. You'll like this. Lots of historians corrected me and said, well, Chamberlain helped with rearmament, which was necessary for taking <laughs> on the Nazis. So they said, actually, he was the worst prime minister since Lord North in the seven, in the 18th century. After, oh, I'm very familiar with Lord North. After yeah, he course. lost, of yeah. course, the, the uh, after, of course, the American successful war of uh, independence. In so your he, face. In your face, Lord in North. In your face, David Lord Cameron's North. They've taken your crown. Yes. But then Theresa May... Uh, looked at David Cameron's title of worst prime minister uh, <laughs> since the 18th century and said, hold my beer. <laughs> so what she did at the beginning, uh, what, midway through April is when the, the Labour's in absolute meltdown, terrible uh, poll ratings. We will crush them as an electoral force. That's what she uh, planned to do. Uh, and of course, then what happened is she went into election, lost her majority, and uh, Britain has been reduced to the laughing stock. Uh, of Europe. So the Conservatives have really played a blinder on this. But on the Brexit, in terms of economic insecurity, lots of people voted to leave the EU because they felt that, you know, Britain has gone through the longest fall in wages since the early 19th century now, right. since the Napoleonic Wars. Lots of people felt there was a lack of secure jobs, their industries had vanished, which their communities depended on. That's why lots of people voted to leave. It's not just the Tories to blame, but also New Labour under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, which failed to overturn uh, a lot of that inequality. Um, and, and you know, equally, I think that point you make about middle class and working class people in the British sense, well, lots of people who are traditionally middle class in Britain have suffered now as well right. for lots of reasons. Lots of professional public sector workers have suffered a pay freeze now for years, which means their wages have fallen quite significantly. Uh, their, their work has become more precarious. I think of university lecturers who who've been casualized and their work, you know, they often don't know how many hours they're working a week. What does casualized mean? So casualized means that you end up with, instead of a, uh, you know, instead of the benefits of being a full-time worker where you have a set okay. hours, a set salary. It's like being an adjunct, I guess. Exactly. You, right. become, you, you don't know basically what hours you get, your, your wages, your salaries completely, you know, fluctuates rapidly. You don't have job security, basically. Right. Um, so, you know, you've got that you've got a housing crisis in Britain where home ownership has been in a state of collapse. It's now back to where it was in the 1980s. And that includes the children of middle class parents, often who end up having to live with their parents because they can't get an affordable home of their own. So I would say what's happened in Britain is uh, oh, and, the, and then there's the issue of student debt. Often children from relatively middle class backgrounds go to university and are saddled with debt, which means their living standards are, are, are suppressed. So we've got in this country, it's true that working class Britain has disproportionately suffered from everything from wages falling, cuts to public services, housing crisis uh, and so on, uh, and cuts to social security. But equally, lots of middle class people have suffered as well. And that's why Labour is able to stitch together a much broader coalition. And I think what we're seeing in this country, by the way, in the late 1970s, we had what was called the post-war consensus. So after World War II, Clement Attlee's Labour government, who's then prime minister, came to power, deposed Winston Churchill and introduced public ownership of industry, high taxes, strong trade unions, government intervention in the economy. In the late 70s, that collapsed. Thatcher came along, introduced a new consensus of deregulation, privatisation, lower taxes on the wealthy and corporations, government retre you know, retreating from the economy. And we're now seeing that consensus is now in meltdown. And what summed up the fall of the consensus of the 1970s was this iconic moment called the winter of discontent mm -hmm. when there was a wave of public sector strikes 
for the right, that's a critical part of the story. The evils of collectivism, big government over, you know, unions with too much power. And this time round, we've just seen the Grenfell Tower yes. atrocity, really, in which right. dozens of working class people burned to death in their own homes in the richest borough of one of the richest cities on, that has ever existed in the history of humanity. And that was a story of uh, a housing crisis because government abdicated to the market, deregulation because of failure of fire safety, uh, where material was used to adorn, to insulate and adorn the building, and flammable, cheaper material was used to cut costs. So now that sums up the fall of this order, an order which puts profit before people, uh, which puts deregulation before the safety of human beings. And I think now what we're seeing in Britain is the Thatcherite consensus, neoliberalism, whatever you want to call it, is in a state of total collapse. Yeah, I think that that's exactly right. Now, it's opening the lens a bit, and I think, and also, uh, uh, you know, there's still obviously divisions inside the Labour Party, though it's it's quite interesting, and correct me if I'm wrong, actually, let's attend to this first, then we'll kind of open it up more broadly. There's always the debate inside politics, certainly in the United States, and it gets laid bare when you talk to different versions of, say, Blair people or Clinton people, mm-hmm. or Obama people for that matter, maybe even more so with Obama people. There's this there, in some ways, it's almost even more disturbing. I always kind of say that the, the people that have emerged in the political moment we're in and have actually kind of counter-programmed what you would expect third-way people to be like, which is, you know, we're the ultimate kind of, you know, this was the Hillary Clinton thing. We know how to win. We're, you know, you might be, we might be less idealistic than you, but we're all about getting and acquiring power and blah, blah, blah. Now, what's odd is that a lot of these people have actually proven themselves quite incapable of getting power in the modern context and actually quite almost idealistically and romantically fixated to this kind of typical, you know, sort of tepid, tepid centrist agenda. Now, there are others, and it seemed to happen after uh, the results of Corbyn, others in the new labor right that seem to, to some extent, reverse themselves and basically just say, hey, we were wrong, and this is about winning, and it looks like Jeremy can win now. And I'm just wondering, you know, again, we'll open this in a, in a broader context, but since he's been in power, there have been endless attempts to dislodge him from members of labor in parliament itself. Obviously, you know, I mean, I couldn't, I, it's hard to imagine Tony Blair voted labor in this election, but you had many other people I'm trying to undermine him. But then after the results came in, everybody from a guy like Jack Straw, who helped lead the UK into the invasion of Iraq, was Tony Blair's mm-hmm. foreign secretary, mm-hmm. to a guy like Alistair Campbell, who might who was Tony Blair's top uh, political strategist, but who seems to me as a type of guy who really is more so than Tony Blair. He's a labor guy, and he really wants labor to win. He has very different mm-hmm. politics than me, but he does seem to kind of have mm-hmm. that conviction. Mm-hmm. So does this tamp down now like i guess what i'm saying is is the right that opposed corbin are we starting to differentiate between just the purely venile like tony blair the people mm-hmm. that actually believe this stuff who you know have this weird kind of 90s politics and the people who were like oh i thought this would fail but now i realize it's successful so i'm on board how is that kind of shaking out yeah, I think you've got – basically, you've, you've got to separate the different factions out there. Um, I mean, if we look at New Labour and what it represented, and you get the kind of, uh, you know, the kind of New Labour nostalgic crew who just stuck in 1997 and can never escape, that's when right. Tony Blair won a landslide victory after 18 years of a conservative government. And they will look at that as the – that's the formula to win, and any departure from that formula will mean catastrophic electoral consequences. Um, and in the and, and the point about the late nineties was that brand of politics was on the march across the Western world. Yeah, the that Clintons was the global were, third way. Yeah, absolutely. The Clintons of the White House. You had Gerhard Schroeder of the Social Democrats um, in Germany. You had Lionel Jospin in France with a third way socialist government. You had uh, in many other countries, from Italy to the Netherlands, the Nordic countries. 
that brand of Tabo and Becky in South Africa was part of those Indeed. meetings. Uh, uh, Cardozo in Brazil. I mean, it was truly global at that moment. It was, and actually, yeah. in Brazil, actually, Peter Mandelson, uh, the New Labour spin doctor, one of the co-founders of New Labour, looked to that Brazilian presidency as uh, as as one of their co-thinkers, and was right. very, you know, was very uh, and so denounced Lula when he took over as president after him. So yeah, that brand of politics was that was a period of that time. It was a period after. You know, there was a period of, of, of free market triumphalism after the end of the Cold War, uh, the form of globalization we'd had, uh, the rise of the new right, the the kind of sense of defeatism the left felt, the lack of any mm-hmm. political project on the left, uh, the left reduced to being very defensive, you know, stop the cut, stop privatization, stop the world I want to get off rather than having a vision of how society could be run. Right. But but clearly now what's happened is new labor have no ideas they have no vision so called centrism has collapsed as any you know centrist what the third way they don't have any political vision whatsoever um, and they don't have anything that relates to the grievances of a western world which has suffered the terrible devastating consequences of a financial sector which plunged us into calamity um, and stagnating wages and insecurity and all the rest of it. They have no answers to these things. But what's the point now is they would always argue, as you say before, look, I'm sorry, folks, you're going to have to abandon uh, a lot of the things you believe in because you've got to win power. And if you don't win power, you can't help the poorest in society. You're actually being selfish if you're left wing, because that means the right will always win. It's your fault as a consequence. And, and, and that's something we've had, obviously, in this country. But you've got to separate people out because Tony Blair, in the first leadership campaign that Jamie Corbyn won in 2015, said that with a left wing program, he wouldn't want to win. Right. So, it, you know, even if that was he did. So he was in the position of two. He thought it was unelectable, but undesirable as well. Right. So that's that wing of Blairism, which would prefer a conservative government to a left wing Labour government. I and want the, marriage equality in the UK. Emirati weapons contracts abroad. Indeed, it's near that likes that yes. likes gay people, basically. Right, yeah, I mean that's right. basically a way of summing it up. Right. You know that you know we'll go and invade Iraq and murder you know hundreds of thousands of people, but uh, but we will accept. And I can say this as a gay man, we'll we'll accept you know uh, get you know uh, equal rights for LGBT people. Yeah, I mean there, there is that definitely. Um, you know, socially liberal, economically free market, that kind of approach. Right. And, but then I think in the Parliamentary Labour Party with Labour MPs, it's not homogenous. They are a small minority, that group. You had others who would have said this is desirable but unelectable, right. which is quite a fundamentally different view. They thought this is heading uh, these sorts of policies and ideas. On an individual level, they would have said these poll very well. So Labour proposing, for example, public ownership of utilities, overwhelming support for that, according to the polls. But they would have said if you put all of these policies together – a big left-wing agenda, then people just won't vote for it. They'll go, you can't pay for it, you can't cost it, and so on. And they'll just go for the Tories because of economic security and they're better at you know, balancing the books uh, or whatever. And, and, and this election discredited that. It showed that is just not true. So those, if you like, were attached to centrism out of pessimism, out of the view the left couldn't win. They've changed their mind, and actually, a lot of them feel liberated. I think Ed Miliband, the former Labour leader, is yeah. one of them. Yes, he went into the last general election with a program that was far more timid than he personally would have wanted. Right, and he felt he had no choice because of the people around him and where the electorate were at. Those people feel liberated now. They feel, oh my word, the electorate are more left wing than we thought they were. This is fantastic. Right. We can finally say the things we want. There is a minority who are looking at this miserably and for example philip collins the former uh who's a former blair speech writer he's been writing in the times calling for a new macron uh, the french president's oh, centrist style party in britain which is amazing isn't it so far they spend years going Don't you already have liberal well, democrats anyways well exactly if you want yeah. a centrist option vote lib dem and about seven percent of the population did yeah i mean you know <laughs> right. centrism is on offer but you know they so their view now they spent a long time their argument was this is never going to win. The British public will never, ever accept left-wing ideas. The evidence is now in. They've gone, yeah, but they shouldn't be accepting these ideas. And now we need a new party to stop that government ever coming to power. So you've got to divorce them. There's the ideologues, and then there was the pessimists. And the right. pessimists now have changed their mind. Yeah, I think we, we have a very similar dynamic in the United States, although it's, it's added, I don't know, less so I think in the UK. There's some people that extraordinarily have actually attempted to use, a, you know, I call it kind of Walmart intersectionality to kind of 
suggests somehow that in the United States, people that don't support any kind of robust economic agenda are actually somehow simultaneously also the genuine advocates for dealing with systemic racism and misogyny in American society. It's a very kind of bizarre political jiu-jitsu, yeah. and it's also on behalf of <laughs> you know people who help build their political careers on signing a, a death warrant for a mentally incapacitated black man, as an example. Yeah, well, exactly. Which, uh, yeah, yeah. So it's quite bizarre. But I do... And, 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 yeah, 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 Clint, yeah, Hillary Clinton talking about predators and all the rest. Right, right. Super, well, super predators was Sorry. apparently acceptable. I, w- I was actually, I was on a program once where I made that point, and and the response that I got was that I was too young and totally unfair because every single person in the 1990s said super predator, and that it was essentially sexist to bring that up. And I actually, literally, on my phone, had like Cornell West quotes from like the 90s in front of me. Of him, you know, condemning this language, but at any rate, I mean, it's it, mm. it's kind of maddening. But you know, certainly not everybody was was saying that in the 1990s. There were people that were you know mm. calling it out then. But as you say, it was a marginalized position, just like you know, globally serious economic policies were marginalized in the 90s. In the 90s, you know, uh, neoliberals were 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 you know reading columns in the New Republic about how uh, you know welfare was was bad for poor people and people of color, and that was trendy Absolutely. neoliberal thinking. So, so, you know, let's be it's clear. It's for their own good. Yes, let's be to clear. To make their lives miserable. Exactly. Let's be clear about the origins of all this stuff and not have and not get twisted about where we are today. But I think, you know, it's quite, uh, in the United States, everything you described as far as skyrocketing student debts, as far as structural inequality, stagnating wages, probably even more extreme than in the UK. And we also don't have an NHS. We don't have the kind of, you know, basic buffers. And in the United States, you definitely see Corbyn and Macron have become the proxies here for, you know, this ongoing debate inside the Democratic Party. You see some people uh, like a guy like Chuck Schumer, who maybe Mm -hmm. to some extent is a bit more operationalized and he's willing to get a bit more serious about higher wages and everything else, although he's not. You know, he's incredibly close to Wall Street, not a particularly effective communicator. Um, But the Macronism versus Corbynism has become that kind of proxy war Mm -hmm. between the center and the left. And, you know, my read is that Macron is fresh. Most of French people, thankfully, don't want fascism. I mean, he was the obvious vote in the second round. Mm -hmm. But it seems to be that if Hollande, who was the previous president and a socialist, but essentially adopted a very market-oriented agenda and did not Mm -hmm. keep on his promises for a stimulus and for a counter-EU strategy to the austerity of Merkel, he left office with literally about a 5% approval rating. I don't see why people are expecting much different from Macron. So my read is that Macronism is the last gasp along with Obama of third wayism. And those are personally, especially in Obama's case, very appealing and admirable people with good leadership qualities, but they did not represent any type of the sort of new politics that we need for the age that ironically Corbyn and Sanders in their seventies both do. Well, spot on. And obviously Sanders would have won and will be president soon. So yes. no, but I think that, yes. that point about uh, Bernie would have won. Bernie uh, would have won. The, Hashtag uh, Bernie, Bernie won. won. <laughs> uh, I slip that in just. I we've got a meme always. at the moment, by the way, which is uh, well, obviously Jamie Corbyn is prime minister. Um, <laughs> in terms of yeah, Macron. I mean, I, when people bring that up here, that Macron being a model, I'm like, all right, introduce a two stage presidential contest, get 24 percent of the vote in the first round, and then go up against the fascists, <laughs> and then claim that's a big victory for centrism. It's ridiculous, right? You know, and, and what was heartening was. Uh, you know, the combined share of Mélenchon, who had a great rally and got, you know, got a fifth of the vote. Also, Hamon, the French socialist candidate, who was very much on the left yep. of the socialists, had, had very similar ideas to Mélenchon. Uh, combined, they got over a quarter of the vote. It was tragic, actually. I think Hamon should have stood down and supported uh, Mélenchon. Uh, and Mélenchon could have become president then. And then, obviously, the narrative would be the onward march of the left. So, right. um, you know, because Mélenchon, the, all the polls showed, would have would have decisively have beaten um, uh, Marine Le Pen, the fascist. Yes. So yeah, I agree with that. I think the problem is, you know, Macron's ended up as a last gasp because of those particular specific circumstances. Um, but at the end of the day, Macron represents 
a defense of the very policies that have bred the conditions that fascism has exploited, right. which is uh, stagnating living standards, uh, public services shredded, shredding of, of, of job security, mass unemployment. All of those things, his policies, you know, will make will make worse the cuts to public the public sector and public sector jobs he's proposing, the cuts to taxes for the rich. Uh, you know, these are the sorts of policies that have already been enforced all over Europe and have caused devastating social and economic dislocation and which the far right have exploited. So, you know, my own fear, obviously, with Marine Le Pen is if she's playing the long game. She just thinks the next presidential election is 2022. And having had two centrist presidents that have failed uh she'll be able to march in there so i think the french left has to prepare and mobilize because there will be big big struggles now in france on the streets and i was in france in in uh in march i think it was uh during that you know in the earlier parts of that of that contest um where it, it's just you know there was a big mass movement there the left has been revived france for a long time is quite depressing politically to look at because Whereas in Spain, you've got the rise of Podemos, right. a left-wing party which opposed the cuts and, and so on. Um, the main beneficiary in France for a long time is the National Front. And what really depressed me, the fascist National Front, what really depressed me about the National Front is for a long time, they, they led amongst French people aged 18 to 25. Right. But in the end, Mélenchon, the leftist, he got the biggest share of the youth vote which is very heartening. Yes. Um, and if it hadn't been for Mélenchon, there's a very good chance Marine Le Pen would have done a lot better. So I think now the task of the French left, I think the left is being revived. We see it in the US. We see it in Britain. We see it in Spain. Uh, we've seen it in, in many other countries as well, uh, increasingly, is to prepare now to take on Macron. Obviously, the left had to vote for Macron to stop the fascist. But they didn't endorse his program. They, they, it was an anti-fascist vote. And now they have to mobilize to stop the attacks on working people in France um, and, and to prepare the foundations for, for a, a revived left, which is in, in a position to win the presidency. Oh, and final question. I, this is an extreme example because obviously Greece is at such a tremendous disadvantage given its size, given its debt obligations, given what the United what the Eurozone has done to it in terms of just sort of a slow motion kind of you know murder through austerity essentially. Um, but you know I, when Syriza came to power a couple of years ago, watching a left party get to power and capitulate. And I think that, you know, there's the Giannis Varoufakis narrative where he really kind of basically, it, it's mm. a frame of, you know, Cipras and the leadership essentially, again, they capitulated, they 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 fell on their sword, they didn't really have the kind of vision or the strength. Um, then there's, you know, uh, someone like uh, 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 Paul Mason, I think, uh, who writes mm -hmm. in the UK, who has a bit more mm -hmm. of a sympathetic read of Syriza, which is, you know, they're really getting forced from all sides and mm -hmm. having Syriza in there has made Greece certainly more humane towards refugees. They've mm -hmm. been able to slightly minimize some of the kind of brutality of what's been inflicted on them. But I think the broader question that that arises for me, and it would have happened, you know, if, if Bernie had won, um, which he would have, if he got the nomination, Bernie, Bernie would, have would have won. Bernie would have won. But if he had won, we um, and it would have been very significant because he would have appointed a, an economic team, which for the first time in decades would have done something regulatorily about Wall Street. There would have been things that out of the gate were of major benefit to the American public. But legislatively, the, a progressive agenda, just as frankly a Hillary Clinton centrist agenda, would be dead on arrival in any Republican Congress. Um, and even if frankly, mostly, you know, <laughs> largely Democratic Congress as well. Mm -hmm. It shows that left politics is also just at a structural electoral disadvantage because of what's happened over the past several decades. We're almost playing on other people's turf in terms of, you know, the power of concentrated wealth and economic dogmas and everything mm -hmm. else. So, you know, as there's an advance of actually gaining power and Jeremy becomes prime minister and everything else, what do you think that kind of larger challenge of of when we start to assume power, but we're almost mm -hmm. still playing in the context of someone else's game. Well, I think Syriza in Greece is, you know, I mean, I was in Greece um, for that election and I, I saw the jubilation on the streets. And when Syriza came to power, it was the first radical left government in, in Europe since the 1930s, really. Um, and, and, and the point about Greece, I mean, I put this to Pablo Iglesias, the, uh, the leader of Podemos in Spain. And, 
you know, I said, look what happened to Greece. They'll just do the same to you if you come to power. And he said, well, look, you know, Greece represents 2% of the Eurozone economy. Mm -hmm. To be brutally honest, it was expendable. They could, the the EU leaders looked at Greece and, you know, Donald Tusk, the head of the uh, European Council said that they weren't, and he said this openly, it's astonishing really. He said they weren't scared about economic or financial contagion they were scared about political contagion. Right. Their worry was if right. Greece was seen to win even concessions from the European Union, having been devastated by cuts which doubled poverty, where unemployment amongst young people at one point was 60 percent, where public services were devastated with the healthcare system in a state of collapse, with suicide and infant mortality increasing austerity killed people in Greece. You know, if, if they won concessions, then people in Spain for example, in Ireland, in Italy, would take the logical conclusion that, oh, wow, well, they did it, so we'll just vote for similar parties. And that would lead to a domino effect across the European Union. So right. they punished Greece, and even though it was possible to do so because Greece is such a small uh, part of the European Union, um, uh, you know, it's a tiny part of the Eurozone economy, um, you know, and they did it as, um, you know, to, you know, to stop them, you know, it's pour corriger les autres, the French expression, it's to stop others taking the same route Mm -hmm. and and Mm -hmm. and the main fear they had was spain that if greece fell if you like then the spanish electorate would vote for a podemos led government which would then lead to an existential crisis of the entire neoliberal project in the european union and 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 i suppose the difference is if you do get a government if for example a government came to power in in uh, in Spain, which is one of the major Eurozone economies, you could never, ever, ever, ever treat them in that way right. because it would lead to a collapse of the entire Eurozone and the European Union. It's just impossible. So, you know, you can't blackmail them. You can't force them into retreat in the same way. In Britain, we're not in the Eurozone, uh, mm-hmm. which is the EU countries. Not all the EU countries have the euro currency and are bound by those rules. Um, uh, but nonetheless, we're, not, we're, we're now leaving the European Union, as you know. Mm-hmm. But the critical point is, if a left-wing government comes to power, they will face overwhelming and formidable opposition uh, from economic elites in their own country and in other countries as well, who will attempt to strangle them at birth. Um, and, you know, there's a famous uh, TV uh, show based on a book which from the 1980s in Britain called A Very British Coup, where a left-wing mm-hmm. Labour government comes to power led by... Uh, This guy, a steel worker called Harry Perkins, and the establishment do everything, economic sabotage, the US gets involved. It was all partly based on what happened to Salvador Allende's government in Chile in 1973, which uh, ended in 1973 uh, with the... uh, On September 11th, in fact. On September 11th, yeah, my own family took in refugees from Chile. It was a, you know, a a, a, a very kind of, you know, one of the big symbolic moments of the the, the, the defeats the left suffered. Right. But but I do think the difference is this time is uh, or what we'll have to do, sorry, is have mass mobilization of people in their workplaces and their communities. We're already seeing the basis of that in this country. We're seeing a mass movement has emerged where if Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party win the next election, which the Conservatives privately think is going to happen. That's why Theresa May a humiliated and disgraced prime minister in many ways is still in power, is still the prime minister because they're scared if she falls, it will lead the way to an election Mm -hmm. where Jeremy Corbyn will become prime minister. And and that would be the first radical left government in the history of this country, uh, which is astonishing in 2017, given what we've gone through over the last couple of decades. But nonetheless, that would then obviously strengthen the left elsewhere. But my plea is to, and this is an international plea for solidarity, we will have to build the mother of all movements in this country, but my word, we'll need international solidarity. And the movement, the Sanders movement, the revived American left, now stronger than it's been in four decades, we will need your support and solidarity because particularly the US presidency and all the rest will try and strangle such a government and isolate it and cause all sorts of economic damage and all the rest to stop others, including in America, doing the same thing. So let's build the mother of all international solidarity movements. Let's mobilize the people, the millions of people all over the Western world who want an alternative, because the lesson will be if we can do it in Britain, then we can do it everywhere, all over the Western world. And the right of, you know, the the right, the economic elites who have been drunk on their own triumphalism for decades now should be absolutely terrified because the hangover is coming 
and what we will see are movements and governments which will redistribute wealth and power in the interest of the majority. They should be for, they should be worried, uh, given they thought they you know it was the end of history and they right. carry on having their big party at the expense of everybody else. But change is coming, but it will need the, a huge movement here, and it will need international solidarity. So yeah, let's do this. And Bernie Solid. would have won, by the way. And Bernie would have won, by the way. And also, I I do want to say on an incredibly petty level, it will be really fun if Jeremy becomes prime minister to watch Trump be like, yeah, I supported that guy all along. Great guy. Is that what he'd do? Oh, I'm sure he would. He would pretend for one. There would be one tweet like strong campaign, many not the few, similar to me! Exclamation <laughs> point. <laughs> you oh. know what? Honestly, if Jeremy Corbyn said that. Trump was a great socialist leader. Trump might pretend or actually so genuinely like him for a couple. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm a like, yeah, I'm a great big, socialist. Big, socialist. big league into Ho Chi Minh. Yeah. It's true. Big league socialism. Big league socialism. That's what we're advocating, Owen. Big league socialism. <laughs> big league socialism. Let's and do it. Solidarity forever. Owen Jones, thank you so much. Guardian, no, columnist, no. activist. Appreciate your time so much. Hope to do it again soon. Will do. Thanks. You too. Bye. It's an honor. Okay, everybody, we're going to go to the fun half where you can join us at 646-257-3920, 646-257-3920. The IMs are on. Support the show. Become a member today. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. All that good stuff. We'll see you on the fun half. She said no, no, no